Good evening. We are starting the formal part of this uh, gathering. So please join us. Come forward, please. And thank you for being here with us tonight. This is the third installment in the new series, The Springtime Salon, uh, which was masterminded by our esteemed Associate Dean of Research, Professor Sonia Chow. It is meant to showcase, yes, please, an amazing effort which uh, we are really enjoying. It is meant to showcase and encourage uh, discussion uh, on the ongoing uh, research at the school. This year, it's focusing on our various graduate programs. And tonight, it features the uh, Master in Professional Science in Sustainable, no, ur Urban, urban sustainability. sustainability and Resilience. I always get it wrong. Uh, next uh, salon, the last one this, uh, ap uh, this uh, term, will be on the Masters in Real Estate Development, so please join us again for the next week's session. So uh, it's great to see also so many colleagues from uh, uh, other schools. I see some from Rasmus, Communications, Engineering. Thank you for joining us tonight. That is exactly what we want a school, a university-wide platform for debate, conversation about ongoing research. I do though want to call out uh, Dr. Tiffany Planton. I want her to say a few words. She has been a great supporter and a partner in various initiatives. She's here representing also the Office of Faculty Affairs, but actually she's the executive director of the Graduate School. Thank you, Dean, Curry, Dean, Dean O'Curry. Thank you, Professor Chow. I'm delighted to be here tonight. As Dean O'Curry mentioned, I'm Tiffany Planton, and I work in the Graduate School. I know for me, this is my first university event um, since COVID started. I, maybe it is for a lot of you, but it's so exciting to see so many community members here together for such an exciting event. Uh, for those of you that don't know, the Graduate School is the central administrative unit overseeing all graduate programs across all disciplines and on all campuses. And interdisciplinary research is one of the key missions of our unit. And so it's so nice tonight to see and to experience the work that the School of Architecture is doing in that same vein. So through tonight's salon, through the new creative and research newsletter that's happening, as well as through the development and implementation of interdisciplinary research programs, such as the MPS program. We hope and we expect to see even more interdisciplinary graduate programs developed at our institution. And I'd like to mention that one of the core things that the Graduate School does is we host events. We also co-host these events with our partners across the university. And we have two events that are upcoming that I really want to highlight and promote here tonight. The first is the three minute thesis competition. This event is gonna be March 10th. It's gonna be right over here at the Lakeside Village Expo Hall. And this is an event when 10 graduate students representing our, all of our schools and colleges are gonna give a three minute presentation summarizing their dissertation or thesis research. It's a live time event in front of a panel of esteemed judges, including Dean L. Curry, who will be a judge this year. So I really encourage you to come. The entire university is um, invited, all faculty, all staff, all students. It's a really fun event to see the exciting, cutting edge research happening at our institution. The second event is the university-wide graduate and postdoc research symposium. That's gonna be on Friday, April 1st. This is a mixed format where we have a keynote speaker, poster presentations, oral presentations, TED like talk presentations. There'll be judging, there'll be monetary, monetary prizes, an award ceremony, food. Again, this is a key way for you to connect with your colleagues across the university. So for the students here, please submit an application to present. The application is now open. You can access it on our website, grad.miami.edu. If you can't present or don't want to present, please just come and check out the event. It's a great way to meet new people, make a connection, 
spark a new idea, and it might lead to something great. So thank you. Thank you, Tiffany. The, just a few more words and we'll get to the formal program. The, you know, the, the, the format of the Salon is evolving and is meant to be more than just one conversation, but many things, an open forum for different events, media happening. So I want to mention an installation by uh, Javier Cortada, which, uh, which is meant to heighten awareness about uh, the mangroves. It's there in the library window. We have various stations bringing information on uh, different things. I want to mention the station with information on the MPS program. And by the way, the co-director of the MPS program Jose Cardoso da Silva is here with us tonight, so I think you should find him, grab him, and talk to him if you're interested in this uh, program that he co-directs with uh, Sonia Chow. Also, we have, uh, where is Teddy? He is, uh, as you know, the sustainability manager, implementing a very ambitious action plan to achieve sustainability on campus, and you also have a station, right, with information. So please also visit him. Do you want to say something? No, uh, sim simply that uh, I'm really uh, thankful to, to be here. Um, I remember the time when uh, uh, I met Sonia at the first uh, South Florida Climate Compact. Uh, we are going on our own, I think paying our own entrance, actually. And, uh, and now we have an MPS in Urban uh, Sustainability and Resilience. That's incredible. In the seven years I've been at UN, I, I, I've seen this uh, inclusion of sustainability and resilience in the curriculum. That's pretty amazing. I can tell you that uh, because I'm, I'm in the community a lot, I, I don't see a, a, a lot of opportunities like this one, the, the MPS. Uh, and even in the state or in the nation, I, I, don't, I, I talk a lot with my counterparts. There's a lot of different offerings. But this one, this MPS, I think is pretty unique because it's, it's answering a demand that is growing. The, the demand for our local government and sp specifically in, in our region for uh, experts in the field. So uh, I strongly encourage you to, uh, to uh, ask uh, Sonia and Joseph for more information. And if you're interested to get involved in general on campus with sustainability, reach out to me, reach out to the table over there. We have a lot of good organization and uh, thank you. Thank you. And finally, I do want to mention some of the videos which were produced by our students, uh, showcasing student work, but also some, some highlights from the last year's Resilience Conference. Check, check it out. So without any further delay, I'd like to introduce uh, Professor Sonia Chow, who has curated this uh, event for us. She, as I, like I mentioned, she's the Associate Dean of Research. This is one of her initiatives, but also she's the co-director of the MPS program in sustainable and resilient, no, I got it wrong again, in urban sustainability and resilience. Thank you. Thank you. It's wonderful to see so many friendly faces here. Uh, thank you so much for coming out. We're really grateful. Uh, that you're interested in this topic and that you're partaking in this event with us. We have a very short program. It's only about uh, 30 minutes long. We will have a panel discussion and then we've invited two discussants from other academic units to ask a couple of questions as well. Um, before that, I thought I'd tell you, before we get started with that part, I thought I would um, just tell you a little bit about the MPS program. It is a program that's uh, deliberately constructed uh, for professionals uh, that want to pursue practice, whether that's in the public sector or in the private sector. It's one of our newest programs at the university, actually a COVID baby, uh, born in uh, 2020. So uh, we have with us this evening uh, the first cohort um, that you'll meet in just a few seconds. But it's a program that uh, students can get through in two years, and it, I think um, the fact that our first graduate who just graduated in December just got a job with the North Miami Beach um, Office of Sustainability as their sustainability manager speaks highly of how this program is preparing future professionals in this arena. So please consider uh, learning more about uh, the program for those of you that are students out in the audience. With uh, 
uh, not much more to add to that. I will introduce very briefly our first uh, cohort of students in the MPS program. These three young ladies, uh, there are two of them here right now, one on the way, apparently dealing with basketball traffic, um, uh, were um, the first students in the program. They come to us with very, various, with very uh, different uh, backgrounds. For example, Perlaquino um, had a degree from the University of Puerto Rico, um, and that was in um, agricultural engineering. She's also a licensed agronomer, if memory serves me. And on the other hand, uh, we have uh, with us Camila Sabla, who uh, is a graduate from Notre Dame University and a degree with, uh, in architecture. And she right now is working in professional practice um, at Plus Serbia. They are both currently working uh, or doing their internship, which is one of the three capstone options that our students have uh, at the Office of Resilience for Miami-Dade County under the um, supervision of Katie Hageman, which you'll meet in just a minute. So um, I thank them uh, for moderating this session. It's a little bit different than the format you've seen in the other uh, uh, salons before, but I, we wanted to celebrate the fact that we have our first graduating class, <laughs> as small as it is. Um, and then uh, hopefully we'll see Paula arrive as well. Uh, Paula's uh, um, background, Paula Viala, is she graduated from FAU with a d uh, degree in civil engineering. So it goes to show that we have uh, students with all kinds of backgrounds interested in our program. In any case, many thanks uh, to them for accepting this challenge and to all of our panelists this evening. Please be reminded that after the event is over, these panelists and the discussants and the student moderators will all go back into the uh, crowd and um, they're um, more than happy to answer any questions that you may have on a one-to-one -one basis. So please stick around afterwards so that you can join uh, the discussion uh, that we hope to spur through the questions and answers um, in this session now. Perla. Hi everyone and thank you Professor Chow for the introduction. I will now introduce our panelists for the night, starting with Katherine Hageman. She is the Resilience Program Manager at the Miami-Dade County of County Office of Resilience, followed with Professor Eric Furley, who is an associate professor at the School of Architecture, most recently published two books. The first is titled Designing Change. Um, you can find that it's for sale um, here tonight. And the other is a collaboration with another faculty member, Professor Victor Dupi, titled The Urban, Hou the Urban Housing Handbook, um, followed with Jacqueline Gonzalez Tuse, who is an architect and founding principal of Tuse Studio. And of course, Professor Sonia Chow, who will also be participating as a panelist, who has been already been introduced by Tina Alcuri. Thank you. <laughs> okay, starting off with Professor uh, Furley. Across Miami Dade County, there coexist various morphological, typological, geological, and economic realities. So resilience varies from one neighborhood to the next. Yet the entire region shares a less than resilient transportation system and monies which were once earmarked by a penny tax for metro rail expansion have gone to creating and repairing more highways, which only adds to greenhouse gas emissions and is short-sighted. How important is it for South Florida's economy and our quality of life that transit authorities and local governments tackle transit more assertively and how should this be undertaken effectively in urban, suburban, and rural neighborhoods where density levels are quite different? Yes, uh, thanks for this. I, I'm, you know, I was wondering, have I been chosen because I teach a seminar of housing and infrastructure, or maybe because some of you have seen me you know, walking bravely with a stroller from uh, Canterbury School to the Metro Rail Station. So I have to say I'm very biased also personally about this topic. And uh, actually, yeah, expressing this so defensively says also a lot about this community and its relationship to public transport, as if somebody really had to still convince others and, and you know, um, make the points clear. So I think this is a, obviously a long discussion, but I also believe that, you know, we have an audience here who is probably quite aware, for example, of the environmental um, advantages of uh, public transport compared to, to the car. You made reference to the particularities of the geography here, for example, in Miami. The, I think the fact that we have a modal, nodal, multinodal um, urban fabric. 
I think, you know, we have seen many proposals that, you know, I, I cannot cite one after the other um, in this community. Somehow, none of them seems to really go forward. Some of you might have heard that there was a proposal to extend the metro rail further south. Uh, eventually, then, this turned into uh, a bus uh, a system. And I think, until now, I haven't even heard about this being implemented. So, um, uh, I think... Obviously, we are not in a place that uh, considers public transport as a necessity. And, um, you know, uh, there are several topics, however, that I would like to add in, in addition to the environmental um, uh, topic. Um, uh, just to finish maybe with the particularities is, um, you know, we obviously have the, the problematic of the soil here in, in, in Miami that you know, it's difficult to use for an underground system. But then again, we see the metro rail, which is elevated. The fact that we um, are multinodal in terms of urban fabric seems to me rather a, a positive thing. So one could imagine that you know, other new developments like the design district are being connected. It doesn't have to be through the same system as the metro rail. Um, you know, the connections to Miami Beach, uh, there are so many studies that, you know, just have not been implemented. So um, I think this is not an argument for uh, public transport not playing a more important role. The, the link to affordability, which is, you know, something else that many people are talking about too. Maybe two words to that. First of all, obviously, um, your life is much cheaper if you don't have to pay for a car or at least not for a second car. So this is an obvious... Uh, argument for the link between affordability and public transport. The other point is, you know, more indirect. If you have to pay for an apartment or uh, as a tenant or, you know, in, in buying it, uh, you might, you know, automatically have access to a parking spot, but, um, you know, obviously this is not for free. So in insisting on uh, parking, minimal parking requirements, we make it also much more difficult to actually offer affordable housing. So I think none of that is particularly original or new. Uh, I don't want to further insist. There are also social advantages, I believe. You know, Miami is, again, not a place particularly known for uh, public space uh, and social mixture. I think if we look at other examples, you know, often actually the public transport itself is an opportunity for social mixture. Not only the transport itself, but then also spaces within the city which are directly connected to it. So all of that, actually, there's an enormous potential here to be a little bit more positive and optimistic that, you know, still can be, can be used. And, you know, maybe to, to finish on this, um, I believe that the opportunity really is to create a desire uh, for public transport, you know, for example, through art projects, um, and also to compare ourselves with actually, most other places that we often refer to as the models of what Miami would like to be. So I think, you know, what has happened until now is maybe not so surprising because, you know, we are a place which comes from a tourist uh, background where, you know, this kind of euphoria of the party life is not that easy to combine with, uh, uh, you know, sitting in a metro rail um, uh, wagon. But on the other hand, you know, we apparently constantly express so much ambition for our future. But, you know, look at cities like even Dubai, which also wouldn't be the first place, you know, to think about public transport or many Chinese cities, Singapore, all over the world. You know, I, I constantly follow what's happening in Paris, you know, even trying to have like a, a above ground um, kind of a ski lift style connection. So I think there, there's a lot of um, there's a lot to do in regards of simple marketing in order to to make clear that public transport can be something that brings people together and that represents our ambition for the future to our own community and to, to the world outside. So I'm, I'm a little bit surprised that many leaders uh, have not yet taken this opportunity on. I hope that answers a little bit. Yes, thank you, Professor Furley. I think we can all take a role in that as well um, for architect Jacqueline to say. 20 years ago, Sustainability was to architecture what resilience is today, which is to say, the outlier, the outlier topic which in less than a decade has commonly become the underlying aspect to design processes. 
We no longer see pushback from developers on having their buildings LEED certified, for example. On the contrary, they see it as an asset when marketing their buildings. So with that recent history in mind, how do you foresee the practices of architecture, urban design, and also of real estate development changing over the next 10 years to more effectively embrace climate adaptation goals? And will all of these professions shift sufficiently and in time to build greater resilience for our communities? That's a pretty big question. I want to start by pushing back a little bit on the premise of the question, which is that most developers have accepted that sustainability and lead is the way to go. My lived experience as a practitioner on the field, on the battlefront, let's call it, of, of this, is that in fact, no, that is not the case. And sadly, uh, unless it's a federal building or it's mandated, we're not seeing the developers embrace that. They may embrace the marketing side of it, and they may, a lot of corporations are embracing the idea of saying that you are sustainable and that you're meeting these goals. But in reality, we are falling short. In LEED, for example, there were only 2,000 buildings designated as LEED buildings in 2019. If you consider the scale at which we're building, you obviously can know that that is token. That's a token of what needs to happen. I am an architect who believes in science. Um, if you follow the science and if you listen to what the UN is saying on climate change, they're saying that we're at five minutes before midnight. What does that mean? For those of you who tell you that sustainability and resiliency are not tied together, those people are lying to you. Because if the temperature of this planet rises above 1.5 degrees, then life as we know it here is no longer uh, going to work. We will lose, we'll have mass extinction, we will have incredible effects of climate change that no one knows were, are survivable. Forget about sea level rise, let's talk about heat, let's talk about a lot of things that are gonna start to happen very quickly. When I look at the sea level rise charts, there's a range, right? And, and, and some of it is, and, and those numbers keep changing. And I almost wish we weren't so fixated on how many inches were rising and by when, and just understand that there's a range. And if we wanna be on the low side of that range, and if we wanna stay under 1.5 degrees, then it is really important that we stop wasting time patting ourselves on the back for the shiny new lead building that is only one of, of hundreds that got built that year and really, really start to drill down on what needs to happen here. As architects, we have a special burden here because our footprint is much, much larger. The things that we do, the planning the, uh, community, the architecture community, has a footprint that will outlive us. So we'll be, in the future, is the patterns that we set are gonna outlast us. So when it comes to Miami, when it comes to sustainability, I just came off of the ULI National Conference, and guess which city is the number one city as far as climate change impact? That's right, it's us. So if we're not having a very serious conversation about how to minimize the damage of climate change, then we are really missing out. And that means, in my opinion, after four years of serving on a board of MRED, which is a master's in real estate and sustainability, and talking to developers, what would it take you to do more resiliency? What would it take for you to do more sustainability? And the answer not one of them gave me, not one, is to say, give me a lead sticker or a sticker that says I'm really resilient. And do you know why? Because it, it costs more money. So the answer is not a system like LEED. The answer is what, and the, and the model that we should be following is what happened after Hurricane Andrew. I graduated in 1992 from Cornell, and I came down immediately after. And what I saw during the course of 1992 to today is that our community, the South Florida community, which we decided that what had happened was unacceptable, that the loss of life and the loss of, pro of property is not acceptable, that we weren't gonna do that again. And so the people that built and the people that, that suffered those damages, we analyzed what happened and we learned from it and we changed our code. And some of it is not sexy. Add a Simpson beam try, use longer screws, connect the roof to the structure. Some of that's meat and potatoes and we don't talk enough about that. But we need to be in the solutions business and I will tell you that as somebody who's really deep into this on the national level, the UN knows what it takes to be more resilient, FEMA knows, HUD knows, and guess what? Insurance companies and lenders know. And they are, as we speak, crunching big data to find out if they're going to insure you at all. And how do they measure resiliency? It's very simple. Are you elevated? Is your mechanical equipment elevated? Do your elevators work after a storm? 
Are you going to be flooded because you have a, a street that you're on that's repetitive loss? They can measure repetitive loss. How? Because they have insurance reports. So all of this is data. This is science, guys. This is not my opinion. This is not what I think. This is data. And so number one, I want to just leave you with this. I could go on and on. I'm sorry. But, but, I, I, but I really feel strongly we as architects need to stop be equivocating and stop being vague about it. We need to be very clear, like we were clear about wind. What do we need to do about flooding? And we need to help the people in power, the people that are in government, understand. Because when they say, we need to do this, we need to do that, and we need to build better, they're looking to us. They're looking to us to define that. And we need to get very serious about saying what that means. So when insurance companies are starting to grade us on whether or not we're doing it and, and give us a, a rating as a community about whether we're resilient or not, that's data. And they were very soon going to be redlining large portions of our communities that already have suffered because most of them have been left behind already from redlining, and we were talking about that. So it's a double whammy. On top of the fact that they don't have housing that's even meeting the wind code, now they're going to get redlined because they're not resilient. So on one side of it, we have to address it from a code standpoint and from a public safety standpoint. So the answer is developers, don't, if I ask them, would you put sprinklers in the building or not, they're going to say, I don't want to because it's more money. If I tell you it's the code, it's part of your bottom line, it's on the spreadsheet somewhere. This stuff needs to end up on a spreadsheet somewhere, it needs to be required if it has public safety implications. On the other side of it, and I'm gonna leave you with a more inspirational uh, conversation, Larry Fink from Blackstone, of all people, spoke to the World Economic Conference and he said the next thousand unicorns, the ones who make a billion dollars, those are the people that are gonna be in climate tech. So while this is our greatest challenge, it is also the source of our greatest uh, innovation challenge. So your generation, and that's why we're all here trying to help your generation, trying to help you understand what the challenges are, but we don't want to just leave you with problems because that is also where the opportunities lie. That is where your future profession lies. I am so excited and so proud of the Uni University of Miami for doing this program because I do believe there's great need for all of us in the profession to get research, to get to, to join hands with acad the academic world, to understand how we can turn this around and how we can really come up with solutions. And so um, that's my opinion about it. We're not anywhere near where we need to be on sustainability. LEAD, I'm not dismissing the value of LEAD because what is LEAD, when I became LEAD, you know, accredited uh, in 2005, is now the code. So what LEAD does is it gives us benchmarks to reach for. And that's awesome on the innovation side. So I'm not dismissing the value of, of a system like LEED, but I do believe it needs to become the code. I do believe that everyone here needs to be w much more concerned about the public, about our communities, get involved, show up when they're talking about the zoning code, and ask yourself all the changes that are being proposed, are they getting us closer to being more resilient, more equitable, and more sustainable? And if the answer is no, do not give the credits, do not give the, the, those extra give me's, put, put a price on them, and the price has to be the public benefit. Thank you. The following question is for Ms. Katherine Hageman, and it goes, earlier this week, NOAA released a revised sea level rise projection report with slightly more optimistic forecasts for some coastal regions in the US. How will you go about reconciling these new projections with the 2019 update of the Compact's Unified Sea Level Rise Projection for South Florida, which resulted from the research of local scientists, academics, and staff? And how will these projections inform your office's priorities, in particular in the adaptation action areas? And finally, how do you see local governments holding onto their tax bases so as to increase their adaptation actions in a timely manner? Okay, so I think first I'll also say that um, for those that don't know, NOAA is the scientific organization that leads a lot of the sea level rise um, and ocean research. NASA was also part of that. So this week they released um, refined projections. I wouldn't say they're, I w don't feel that they're more optimistic. Some people have said that they give us more time. I don't see that. Um, so. I'll say that the the projections that were released are really really similar to what we're using um, for the county and for our own planning and for the regional compacts projections are very similar. Basically what it's saying is that as we move through time, we have more certainty on what's going to happen o over the next few years. We have a pretty um, high certainty of what we can expect by 2050 and then as we get further out, it's more uncertain because we don't know how much um, 
how much warmer Earth will get, how quickly ice sheets are able to respond, because we've never observed that. So we have more uncertainty as time goes. But the county sea level rise strategy is oriented around planning for two feet of sea level rise. So with these new projections and with the previous ones, two feet of sea level rise is, should I live to um, you know, be an old lady, I'll certainly see that over my lifetime. So it's um, in a pessimistic scenario, we could see that by the 2050s. In a best case scenario, we could see that by the 2090s. Um, but two feet of water is coming, and I would agree that it's a better way to think about it is to say that, you know, when exactly, we don't know, but it's certain that we'll see that much water. So unfortunately, we have to find ways to accommodate that in our, in our landscape. One of the other things is that I think psychologically it's hard to think about 2090 or 2050 and you know it, it's helpful to try and bring it home a little bit like for example my son when he's third in his 30s and going to be you know perhaps looking for housing it's we'll have an extra foot of water on the landscape which doesn't sound like a lot when we're sitting here in Coral Gables but you know, when you think about some of our communities like Key Biscayne that are just a foot to two feet above sea level right now in many cases, you know, it's a very difficult process to adapt some of our spaces when we have an existing built environment. Miami Beach has been really, really leading the way in trying to update the public realm with the streetscape and the utilities. But when you have existing buildings that are lower, it's very difficult. You know, it's not, there's no easy answer there. Um, so it's going to take a lot of time for us to adapt those places. Um, so in the sea level rise strategy, we have a, a very clear map that shows with that two feet of sea level rise, how many days a year will we expect to see flooding? And there are a lot of places where it's, it's, it's 300 days a year, you know? So that's basically being underwater unless we raise them or, or otherwise uh, find ways to, to adapt those places. So there's certainly a lot of work to be done for the... Um, for us to respond to the changes that we're um, going to be seeing. So I, I, that's how I see the updated projections. We, we will reconvene the group that, um, that put together the regional projections so we can kind of refine what, what we have and what we're using, um, and that'll be helpful. But by and large, what we heard this week is basically the same. So long story short, there's no way to get out of a foot of sea level rise, um, and two feet is likely if you, if you have... Um, um, a few decades left, <laughs> hopefully, uh, to go. So I think our sea level rise strategy, we lay out a bunch of um, approaches, and, and that's what we're really working on. But I think what you bring up is a really good one about um, tax base. And I think sometimes um, I'm, not the be I'm not the best person to speak to it, because sometimes we get into a situation where we have... Um, Miami is, I, I would have never predicted that Miami would grow so much in the past six years. You know, I moved down here. My background is in sea level rise. I was lucky to get this job and came with sea level rise as my, on my mind and why I moved here. And to see the scale of growth in very low-lying places over the last six years is really disorienting. I mean, I think it's very understandable being here six years. Like, I love Miami. It's very understandable why so many people are coming. It's such a uh, vibrant and, and beautiful place to be. So I, I really understand that. But I would echo that I don't think that we're not really integrating this knowledge into our practices. So a lot... One of the things I'll say, I'm not an architect, my background's in environmental science, and I often get asked, you know, are these buildings that are being built today going to last, or can they withstand sea level rise? And that's not something that I can answer, you know? And that's one of the things that I think is, it's great to be here at the School of Architecture, because, you know, uh, presumably you, and in combination with the structural engineers, uh, hopefully can answer that. And, um, but I'll say that I think that in my observation, we haven't seen a lot of integration of what we know is coming into, into the design and into the, the changes. Obviously, we work all day, every day, to try and, and increase that. And, um, you know, and there are certainly beautiful examples of when it's, been, when it's been done well. But I would also agree that day to day, most of the time, I don't know that the sea level rise in... in um, inevitable sea level rise that we'll see over the next few years has really been integrated into the designs. Um, so that's a, a real challenge, and you know we're fortunate. Uh, nice to be here at UM because you guys can can help change that. Um, but I think that's that's one of the main challenges uh, that we have moving forward. Good evening, Professor Chow. <laughs> Thank you, Katie. 
So whereas sustainability goals are planetary, resilience actions are quite hyper-localized. And furthermore, there are existing conditions, be they related to poverty levels, affordable housing, or the insidious rise of sea levels, to mention but a few, which aggravate and complicate adaptation actions. What are some of the tools needed to further facilitate local resilience projects? And are any being developed at this university, new link initiatives, or by federal funding? Or are they finding their way into the classroom? Provide us with specific example of how these tools and research help to shed further light upon our local vulnerabilities and help public and private sectors alike prioritize our funding or policies to facilitate micro or macro scale adaptation actions. Kindly tell us about your most research sent research endeavors. Yes, Professor Tao. Um, those were a lot of questions. So if I forget uh, to answer them, you'll, you'll come back. Um, so for those of you that are not um, part of the University of Miami's uh, faculty, I see that we have a lot of visitors with us and students. I'll start by telling you a little bit about the university's um, ULINK program, which they've just sort of asked me about. Uh, the ULINK initiative uh, is um, fostered through the Office of um, Research um, under uh, the Vice Provost for Research, Aaron Kobitz's office. It's intended to um, uh, sort of um, help faculty, um, along with students that join their teams, to do interdisciplinary research. We know that we can no longer really be working in separate silos, and in order to be innovative, efficient, and to tackle some of the complex issues that we have before us, we've learned that to do so in an interdisciplinary manner is the most effective way to get there. So I've had uh, the pleasure of being on two ULINK teams. Uh, the first of those uh, ULINK uh, projects ended about two years ago now, and it was led by my colleague at Rasmus, uh, Dr. Diego Learman. And we had faculty from uh, the marine sciences, as well as from engineering, from communications. I saw Yotika in the crowd uh, with us, um, and, uh, and myself from, um, from uh, the School of Architecture. And the intent in that occasion was for us to look at how uh, and to what degree our um, coral reefs um, can actually protect our uh, um, cities. And so what we did was we combined all of the data science uh, information that we were getting from uh, the scientists and from the engineers, and we coupled that uh, with some of the uh, synoptic survey work that we were doing on the land side to better understand the building characteristics and the urban morphology of the city. And we used um, uh, uh, an additive model, one that I had um, created with a, another colleague, Benjamin Gansa, thanks to a prior NSF grant, um, where we can take all of these different aspects, weigh them, and then try to, at the parcel level, really granular, uh, analysis, understand the vulnerability of buildings to storm surge flooding, which of course is what um, the reefs can, can protect us um, from. And what we were able to do is actually quantify from one parcel to the next to what degree an enhanced reef versus a current reef versus a deteriorated reef would actually protect, protect the urban core. We hope that Research such as that, when we turn it over to cities, and we were, by the way, collaborating very closely with the city of Miami Beach on that initiative, and it continues today um, because they're actually implementing the enhanced reef offshore. Um, when we collaborate with our city partners, such as Ms. Hegeman's office and others, we actually learn a lot from them, and we can make uh, tools catered to um, deliver the information that they need so that they can make uh, better informed choices. The research initiative that I'm working right now on, uh, we just uh, won uh, another ULINK project. I saw that my colleague, Vili uh, Kurafalu, is here from Rasmus somewhere, and uh, she and I are co-leads on a new team where we're going to take that SSBV model and we're going to add new components. We have uh, faculty uh, from nursing. Uh, I saw um, my Dr. Matsuda here as well, um, and Matsudi, uh, and we have um, 
uh, faculty from business and faculty um, from uh, geography who are also part of this team. And we will continue to um, work on this model, um, allowing the students from our MPS program, but also from my current course, um, to be engaged in this research. I have to thank Tim because he's facilitated their being able to do that work. Um, we have a collector app that we've modified so that they capture the kind of data that we know to be very crucial here in South Florida. Uh, believe it or not, it's very difficult for you to be able to access uh, information related to the base flood elevation, or I should say the lowest habitable floors finished floor elevation. You can find it in, uh, you know, pockets. Uh, insurance companies have it, but they're sort of protective of it. Um, and you have county and city governments that also have it. Sometimes they have very old records, not necessarily uh, digitized. And so it makes collecting all of that data rather time consuming. So through these collaborations with other academic units, we're able to kind of really focus in on these issues, providing the tools necessary for decision makers be they in the public sector or in the private sector. You heard Jackie talking about how decisions are being made by uh, the private sector, but also the nonprofit sector. And everyone's trying to figure out where do I put my resilience dollars so that they could be most effective and really protect our assets um, better. And so these tools that we're producing here at the School um, of Architecture, I know that I have other colleagues out there uh, that um, are at our school who've also been on other ULINK teams and have done very interesting work on seawalls and communicating with uh, our, our um, communities uh, more effectively. We're all here trying to create the tools necessary to help our partners in the community to reach our collective resilience goals. By the way, here's a pitch. Uh, we have a publication that's going to be focusing on this, hopefully out by the end of the year. Look for it, Calibrating Coastal Resilience. Can I add one thing? Yeah. yeah. Um, one, another. <laughs> the College of Engineering also has been developing uh, concrete uh, that doesn't rely on rebar. So one of the things that we're looking at as a practical solution is how do you, when you know your feet are going to be wet for most of the year, how do we design buildings to withstand that? And so that kind of material science is really important, and that's the kind of solutions, you know, oriented for the, for the practitioners to, to sort of adapt and, and change the way we build, which is really, really, where Miami is a concrete town, most of the world builds with concrete, so, and that is a huge carbon issue for, for us in, in, on the planet. So getting to, to really look at concrete, and, and another student I heard about was on the mayor's cafecito talk from UM, talking about carbon sinks. So the, the array of climate tech, both on the materials side and, and on construction side, that needs to be invented is just amazing, and this is the right place for it, so. Thank you to both of you. Um, we are running a little short on time, so I will go ahead and introduce our discussants so that they can ask one question to the panelists. Um, starting with Hearns Marcelin, he is a professor of social sciences at the, and the, at the University of Miami and chancellor at the Un Inter-University Institute for Research and Development. And Professor Tim Norris, which is a librarian associate professor and also works with the Department of Data Science here at UM. Hello, thank you. It's working? Okay, thank you. Thank you for this wonderful event. And you know, while each one of your colleagues were talking, uh, I kept seeing the importance of the work of architecture in the lives of people, everyday life of people. And there is one question that comes is, what are the possible, what do we do in order to have community participation in thinking about resiliency, in thinking about sustainability, you know? And, uh, and I think that maybe this question may be more appropriate for you, uh, Sonia, Professor uh, uh, Shao. Uh, it's, it's a very important question because it's also linked with so many different dimensions. And I am from the global health programs. I am from health environment is a question. So, the issue is about ex the existence of humankind, the existence, how do we inhabit the world? So how do you offer the opportunity for those who do not have the skills that we have at this level in universities 
to have their voices echoed in prevention, in creating you know, path for skills and resiliency and uh, sustainability? Right. So that's a wonderful question. I'm actually going to answer it, but maybe Katie, Katie Hegeman can add to it because she's been doing a lot of work in the communities for several years now related to the adaptation action areas. But very briefly, here at the School of Architecture, um, you know, back in 1992, we established the Center for Urban and Community Design right at the heels of Hurricane Andrew when we saw that there was a gap right between the public sector, which was all concentrated in downtown Miami, and people that had been affected by this uh, massive hurricane down in South Dade. And for many years, that center has been very effective at partnering with communities, precisely because we enter into those discussions uh, respectfully, understanding that we are not there to teach other people what to do, but we're there to be good listeners and good partners with them in trying to frame what they have as concerns and try to come up together with solutions. We do that typically with uh, collaborations that include uh, individuals from different disciplines. Um, Katie and I worked together on a resilient redesign uh, for the compact a few years back where we followed the same model. And in each one of those cases, what we try to do, Hearns, is bring in experts be they biologists or engineers, uh, people that are working in public health or that are working with other issues uh, that are very specific to that community. Because if there's one thing that we've learned, those of us that have been around uh, the resilience world for a little while now, we know that it differs from sustainability, right? As the students mentioned, sustainability does have these sort of planetary goals that, are, uh, that bring everyone together um, uh, and um, can be very similar in many ways, um, although the practice are, um, is going to be slightly different. On the other hand, resilience is really hyper-localized, right? It's something that we have to do at the level of neighborhoods. So what might be true for the West Grove might not be true for the rest of the Grove, just to use one example in our own backyard. Um, what might be true for the northern part of the Gables will definitely be very different from uh, for those neighborhoods that are sitting on the other side of Old Cutler Road, for example, talking about diversity of income and uh, different realities um, in these communities. But we also have issues of gentrification that we're going to have to kind of uh, embrace as well as we continue to have these conversations with our communities because many of our highest you know, uh, level uh, neighborhoods or neighborhoods that are at the highest uh, um, topography happen to today be some of our uh, more impoverished neighborhoods. And so it, it's very important that we understand that resilience is about how we build. It's also about how we understand and protect and use our environmental resources um, in, in ways that are uh, smart. Um, but it also has to do with being uh, economic, you know, having a mind, uh, being mindful of economic issues and also, very importantly, the social issues. Because if we're not uh, fair-minded about how we move forward on some of these issues, we will, in fact, have a city that is only a city for the ultra-rich in the future, right? Um, uh, my colleague Hal Wanless over in geography has said on a number of occasions when he's guest lectured in our class um, that, you know, Miami one day will become the new Florida Keys. I'm hoping that that's really far down. Uh, the line, but it's a reality that we have to be very conscious of. And if we don't, if we want to avoid that happening sooner, it means we have to take greater actions today. And those actions should start by partnering with our communities very effectively. Our center um, at the School of Architecture is now being led by Stephen Fett, and he and Rick Lopez are both doing a great job of, of leading us into the next uh, phase of that center. So more to come on what the School of Architecture is doing to engage with communities in the near future. Katie, I don't know if you want to say just a couple words on uh, your experience on AAAs. Well, I would just say, uh, one thing I would add is that I think we've seen, fortunately in Miami recently, we haven't had a strong hurricane, but in communities that have recently, um, there's really clear evidence that the disaster worsens inequality not only between the rich and poor, but also racial inequality. And, and, and there are many reasons why, but in, in a lot of cases, we'll have um, an impact there. And then in the wake of that, then there's a rebuilding process. And that rebuilding process has, in other cases, tended to worsen the inequality um, in part. And there are many reasons, and I could talk for a long time about that. But that's one of the things that we know is could ha 
if we get hurt by a hurricane this year, the de facto forces are kind of um, behind that. So one of the main actions in our uh, sea level rise strategy is to try, and in our resilience strategy, is to try and plan ahead for the disasters so that we can recover in a just way. And I'll say, you know, I think right now that's just aspirational. We don't have necessarily the mechanism or the programs to really, um, you know, do that as well as we would like. But that's... That's one where I think it's the, the hurricane is this acute shock, but it's very similar to climate change in the sense that for some folks, after a hurricane, let's say waterfront uh, house gets ruined, it's an opportunity to rebuild. <laughs> they, re they redesign and they re-elevate. And, and it's not, um, it, of course, it's traumatic for everybody to go through that, but it's not financially a hardship. Whereas for other people, the expense of you know twelve thousand dollars to patch the roof can be just too too much, and, and and there are real examples of how that leads to a cycle down to homelessness because you can't repair the roof, and then you have mold issues, and then you have predatory people trying to buy the house from you, and so um, it, we we can see it both in the short term, you know, how do we prepare and respond to those storms, but it's very similar to the long term thing in the sense that we have. For some folks, some of these expenses are, are very small in the context of, of the real estate transaction. And for, you know, a large percent of our community, you know, they're, they're kind of unfathomable amounts of money. You know, so how will we kind of choose as a community to make sure that everyone can, you know, if their septic system is backing up into your house, you know, what, what, what do we have in place so that we can switch folks from the septic system that's not working onto a centralized sewer, you know, in order to protect, you know, their health, but our community's health as well. You know, we have unacceptable situations right now where, where people don't have that sanitation. So, I, but we have to create those programs and those mechanisms in our community. A lot of them don't exist. And a, a lot of the traditional disaster response has not, um, not served us well. So we have to really create new, new programs. Oh, so this is a new question, or it could be. It'll be a continuation. Oh. So you maybe can, can I just speak to to that quickly, because I, I wanted to say something more specific, because I forgot it before. To our profession, you know, we are here at the School of Architecture, and when I spoke about desirability, that might be important to take decisions about my, you know public transport. Then I think what we can do is also to visualize it. I mean, you know, some things are just simple. We are drawing. And you know, if you talk about the relationship to the community and participation, I think one of the simplest things that we can do, and I think there's an enormous potential for us to do it much better and to use you know, new technologies to communicate, is we can visualize something that afterwards becomes the base for discussion. So I think it's not only about how to take on from outside all this information that we need, but then also then to, to have something to discuss, you know, to be able to concretely describe a future possibility. So I think that's important for a School of Architecture. So good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here and thanks for having me. Um, that is a perfect segue into the question that I think would be good that keeps running through my head right now. So for those of you who know me, I'm a map maker and GIS geek. Um, and this kind of leads right into that question of what kind of stories do we want to tell with these visualizations? And, and the question that I pose to this panel is um, perhaps um, you're likely aware of Ian McCard's work several decades ago where he did some visualizations, many layered visualizations of how to do kind of urban or even just planning with nature, I think was the name of his book. Um, design with nature, there we go. And uh, so I asked to the panel, what kind of things, including community uh, information, that, like perhaps from the census, or other kinds of variables that we could bring into thinking about what does um, resilience really mean and how can we visualize it? And I think it goes beyond what we heard in, in this, where it's not just about sea level rise, that's an important piece of it, but there's a lot of other things going on. So my, my question is kind of, what other things can we include when we start talking about what is community resilience? And I really want to emphasize that word community. It's for me, I understand that we're in an architectural audience here, it's about buildings, but I think that uh, what 
what what we were getting at in that last question was was you know how do we bring the community into it and what kind of community information that maybe even elicited from the community or from like the Census Bureau or things like that might we use. Right, so I'll start us off. Um, I know we're running really late and I apologize for that, um, but I can tell you that as part of our new U-Link project, my colleague uh, Kurafalu um, is actually uh, organizing a community um, event where we can engage with our stakeholders as, uh, so that we can learn more from them what we need in order to make our modeling more effective um, this is just one aspect. Then there's the communication part, and that's where the book project that I mentioned before um, will allow us to take all of the different maps that we've in fact created to show you all the different layers of vulnerability that we have, whether that's related to the building aspects or to flooding or it's related to some of the social aspects so that people can see how these all sort of are playing independently, but then we have one map that shows you what happens when they all come together so that they understand the, the sort of totality of that picture as well. And that's just uh, a couple of things that we're involved with directly um, to be able to more effectively tell those stories by using technology to our best advantage to communicate more effectively. I don't know if anyone else would like to add. I, I would just add that as architects, especially or planners, one of our superpowers is to take the complex and make it graphic, as, as, to your point, and to, and to inspire people to spend money on, on a bigger vision, which is what's needed because they're going to have to spend money on infrastructure, which, let's face it, some of it's not sexy, like septic to, to sewer is a concept that needs to be brought home to people. But we need to explain it to people because there's a lot of fear, and then because there's a lot of fear, there's also a lot of people kind of benefiting from that fear and insecurity to say, well, we don't have answers. We don't know what to do yet, so therefore we do nothing. So we need to be in the business of solutions. We need to be making things that are difficult, explaining it to communities, having what we did with the Banda Allen Institute on the Jose Marti Park, for example, is we invited people wherever they're at, and I know that Catherine's group has done it on, on the Chief Resiliency Office. You invite them in, you explain really complicated things to them in a graphic way so they understand, lessen the fear of it, and then provide Solutions. We, we, you know, we have to try things. Some things are going to work, and some things are not going to work. And some things are going to be too expensive. And something, but we have to start somewhere. And and I think that's our, our gift and our and our burden and our responsibility as 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 designers, as urbanists, is to to make sure that we're working with scientists. We're taking your numbers. We're taking your complicated maps, and we're reducing it down to something that people can understand. Uh, the, the gentleman you spoke of, he, that was his gift. He was on the news, he was on the radio, he wrote books about it, and he, he reached the public where they're at, because right now all they're hearing is the fear and the insecurity and, and the problem. They're not hearing very much at all about solutions. So I'm gonna wrap this up, um, and I, I'm gonna ask Eric and, and Katie, who I'm sure would have had more to contribute to this topic, to join us all um, in the audience. Dino Curry, I think, has some final closing words for all of us, so I'm gonna hand over the, the speaker to him. Thank you. Just want to mention that I really encourage you to stay, because that's the salon, actually, this com the conversation after the panel. I would like to also to thank our panelists, our moderators and discussants for the th thoughtful discussion and also invite you to join us next week for the uh, Masters in Real Estate Development conversation, which will address similar issues. Thank you very much. So just as a reminder, you may have seen that there are propagules, uh, little mangrove propagules sitting on your table. Those are actually made available to us thanks to the generous uh, collaboration from uh, Plant Tea. Um, and so you're encouraged to take those home and plant them in your backyards because the future is that we're going to have uh, higher uh, water tables and uh, greater salinity levels in that water table. So uh, we need to be planting trees today that will be able to endure that future condition. So please take them home and plant them in your backyard. Thanks again for joining us. Bye-bye. Super cool. I've been trying to make mango propagules from my tree.